the message is titled, Words of Spirit and Life. Now, do you remember when you were a kid and people would call you names? And, I, you know, I don't know what kids say nowadays, but I know what they said back then. We'd say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. <laughs> yeah, that's a lie. We'd also say, I'm rubber, you're glue, bounces off of me and sticks on you. Did you ever say that? I still say that. No, I'm just kidding. So name calling can occur when kids aren't mad enough or brave enough to punch somebody in the nose, but they can at least throw a word at them. You know, that's a little bit safer. Just throw a word at them. Well, you're a, you know, you're a dummy. You're a jerk. You're a whatever. And so kids do name calling. And as a response to name calling, um, Kids say, well, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never, will never hurt me. But the fact of the matter is, is words can really hurt. They can really hurt. In fact, a punch in the eye you're going to get over in a week or two. But words could stick with you the rest of your life. They're that powerful. But kids want to say, no, you, you, you don't have my goat. <laughs> you don't bother me. You're not hurting me. You could say all you want. But really, 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 those words get down into your subconscious, into your spirit, and they can fester, and they can stay there, and they can hurt you. Now, if it is somebody that you don't respect this name-calling, it's a little bit easier to let it go, isn't it? But if it's somebody you have some kind of respect for, it's really hard to let the words go. You realize that? Okay. Words can never hurt me is something that children say, but we know better, don't we? Words can sometimes cause the deepest wounds. Words carry enormous, immense power. Now, this is something that most of the world doesn't recognize because when I say they, they, uh, they carry with them great power, I'm talking not just about psychological. I'm talking about spiritual power is in words. Words can build up or words can destroy. Words can be weapons against the enemy, or they can be healing salve to those who are hurting. The devil understands the power of words. Words are his greatest weapon, in fact. It is with well-crafted words that are lies that he controls the lives of billions of people. With well-crafted words. Lies. That's his greatest weapon. Words are not to be seen as a simply non-physical, intangible vibration of the air, but they actually carry the kind of power that created the universe. Words. We take words lightly many times because of the things we let escape our mouth, don't we? It's hard to take back the words once they've come out. Yeah. So Hebrews 11.3 says this, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made out of those things that are not visible. Do you realize the creation that you see all around us was created by God's words, his words that he spoke out. He spoke and the world came into existence. The scripture tells us something that we don't often talk about. We talk about the importance of God's words, but what we don't often talk about is the importance of our words. You know, your words have power too. We believe that God's word can move mountains, but our words are just meaningless vibrations in the air. But that's not what God thinks about our words. God believes that our words are important. Even our idle words are empty, rather meaningless words. God says they're all important. Now we say, nah, th not that one, not those words. God says every idle word is important. Jesus says once again in Matthew 12, 36 through 37, but I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless or idle word they have spoken. For by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. If we actually believed that, I believe it would put a filter on us where we wouldn't just say everything that we say so freely. If we really believed, every word would be judged. You know, if we truly understood the power of words, 
that is hidden from the eyes of those that don't grasp the things of the Spirit. If we truly understand the spiritual power of words, I think we would be more careful about what we say, wouldn't we? Words are like fire. Is fire good or is fire bad? I suppose that depends on what you're doing with it. If you're using fire to cook your food and to warm your home, it's good. But if fire is engulfing your house, it's not good. It's destructive. But either way, fire has the power to do something magnificent. The point is this. Fire has enormous power, and that power can be harnessed for good, or if left uncontrolled, it could be powerfully destructive, can't it? You know your words are like fire? Your words are like fire? I remember when I was a kid. I lived in California, and we go up into the mountains, and uh, there's a place called Lake Arrowhead, beautiful place we'd visit all the time as kids in the summer, and it had tall pine trees, and the ground was all covered with long pine needles, and they were all dry because it was summer, and there'd be all these pictures of Smokey the Bear everywhere, like, only you can prevent forest fires. Don't drop a match. Don't drop a cigarette because this thing could all go up like that. And every year there were fires. I remember, now this is maybe even a little more normal seemingly now than it used to be because of what has happened in the last few years. But 10 years ago, you never heard about these kind of things up here in Washington. And that was this. When I was a kid, I would sit in my bedroom, second story of my house, and I'd look out in the summertime and all of the hills would be on fire. That was normal. Fires all the time. It was dry. People were careless with their cigarettes. They'd throw them out the window of their car, and they'd set the forest on fire. Can you imagine if you really believed that words were like a fire? Can you imagine how much more careful you would be with words? Here's what James says about uncontrolled words. James 3, 6 through 12. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting the entire body. It can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises the Lord our Father. And sometimes it curses those who've been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter? Does a fig tree produce olives and a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water out of a salty spring. But your words, the things that come off your tongue, they're a fire. They're a fire. Now, I could try to convince you that words are powerful, and, and I could say they're really important, but why should I try to convince you if you're a believer because God's Word says they are powerful? Well, I, you got to convince me. I don't need to con- God says they're powerful. He says that your words are like fire. They're powerful. So can we agree with God's Word? The Word of God is the thing that saved you. It's got to be pretty good. The Word of God is the thing that reveals the person of Jesus Christ to us. It's got to be pretty right on because if we're messing up and and, and the Word isn't true, our whole life's in vain. But the Word of God is true. It is the power of the gospel message, which are words, that bring salvation to the lost. Words, words about the truth bring salvation to the lost. I was one day told about Jesus. I'd heard about Jesus, but I didn't know Jesus. And I was told one day that I could know Jesus. And I was told one day that Jesus wants me to know him. And I was told that Jesus invites me and every other sinner to come to him and that he would cleanse me and make me a brand new creation. I heard words, and the words were so powerful to me, they pricked my heart. They caused me to say, that's what I need. And it changed the course of my whole life. Now, those are powerful words. What about the words we say? What about the little fires that we're spreading every time we open our mouths, right? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to those who believe. That's what the Bible says. The gospel, the gospel. 
So I think it's really easy for us to believe that God's Word is powerful, don't you think? But often we forget that our words are powerful. If our words were lit matches, we would be more careful with what we let fly out of our mouth, depending on the environment. If you're in a very dry, flammable, inflammable environment, you're going to be careful what you say if your words were actually like fire, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? The problem is this, is that we really don't think our words are that important. We don't look at our words as lit matches that carry power. We look at our words as burnt up matches that really don't do anything, but that's not true. They are powerful. It is a lie, and the devil wants you to believe that your words don't matter. You can say whatever you want. It really doesn't matter because they're just words, and words don't have power, but that's all a lie. Do you understand that? God's word carries power, but never forget this. Your words carry power. Your words carry power. Proverbs 18.21 in the Amplified says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it and indulge in it will eat its fruits and bear the consequences of their words. Now, I don't want to bear the consequences of all the words I've ever said. Do you? There's some words I don't want to bear the consequences. So that's why we sow seeds sometimes and then we pray for crop failure. Oh, God, please. Oh, God, just let that one die out. But we still have to be careful about what we say. If words had no power, then there would be no consequences. If words had no power, they certainly couldn't bring life or death to situations. But this says that your words can bring life and death into situations. But all the ifs, if words didn't matter, if they really weren't important, all the ifs don't really matter because what God says about it is what matters. And God says our words are powerful. It says life and death are in the power of our tongues. What comes from your mouth can change everything. Well, I know what comes from God's mouth. What comes from your mouth can change everything. Romans 10.10 10 says this, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Your words count. Your words mean something. If words are important, then we need to wake up to something that's largely overlooked. Just as important as it is to speak the right words, it's also vitally important to listen to the right words. Yeah. There's a lot of words that are being spoken by a lot of different things that are poison. They're toxic. The words you hear can affect you for good or for bad. Luke 8.18 says this, so pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But to those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away. You got to be careful about how you hear and what you hear. When God's word is being spoken, you need to tune in and say, what does God say? But when those other words are spoken, those words that are contrary to God's word, we got to tune those out, right? A little sugar and a fruity flavor can make the Kool-Aid go down good, even if it's got cyanide in it. You know, there are some songs that have such great melody, I didn't realize for years I loved the song's melody. I didn't realize what the words were. And when I heard the words, I go, oh, my God, I can't be singing that song anymore. But you see, the devil puts a little sugar on it. He's it's like, oh, that's a good beat. That's a good song. But he's putting, he's implanting in your subconscious words. And these words can be destructive. You got to be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you feed your soul, okay, when it comes to words. Cut out the toxic poisons. Cut out the unhealthy junk food that you're listening to. And feast on God's word because it is enabled to save your soul. It is enabled to give you spiritual life. Life is in God's word. I want to direct your attention to a couple of verses in the Bible and break some of the meaning of individual words down that are spoken. Romans 10, 17 says this. So then, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay? Now, let me read that again in the Amplified. To further amplify it, the Word of God says this, So faith proceeds from spiritual hearing. Moreover, this hearing is consummated through a rhema word from Christ. Now, the word here used for Word of God is the word rhema. It's a Greek word. And here's what rhema means. A spoken word made by a living voice, commonly used in the New Testament for the Lord speaking His dynamic living word in a believer to in birth faith. 
God's dynamic living word is spoken so that faith can come into your heart and birth this life that the Spirit gives. Now let's look at another verse, and this word rhema is used again. John 6, 63 says this. The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are full of spirit and life. Now we're going to emphasize some of the words in this verse and amplify the meaning of it. I'm going to throw in some of the Greek as we read it. I'm going to try to read it again here. John 6, 63. The Spirit gives life. What kind of life? It's zoopeo, it's called. It means to make alive, to make that which was dead alive, to cause to live, to quicken. And then it says, the flesh counts for nothing. The words, what words? The rhema word, the spoken word by the living voice, by God himself, it's dynamic, and it embers faith. He says, the words that I've spoken, they're full of spirit, pneuma, the Holy Spirit of God, and life, zoe, the God kind of life, the kind of life that gives life to your soul. Words are important. Words are so important. They are the very thing that saved you. Words that you believed in. By faith, you believe in some words. The words that declare a truth. And believing that truth got you salvation. If you didn't ever hear it, if the preacher had never been sent, you wouldn't know, you'd still be lost. But words have power. Now, here's my paraphrase of John 6, 63 that we just read. I'm going to put it all together without interrupting myself and just kind of amplify it in my own way. John 6, 63, the Spirit of God gives life to that which is dead. The living words spoken by the mouth of the Lord enter into the heart of a believer and bring about faith. The words that have been spoken by God's Spirit are full of God's Spirit and God's Zoe, supernatural life. They're full of life. So go ahead and try to tell me that words... Don't have power. Words have power. Words have great power. It's so easy to believe that God's word has power. But we just forget how often our words have power. Here's another verse I want to take a little closer look at. John 15, 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now let's dive a little deeper into these words and and. Add a little bit of the Greek understanding. Here's what it's really saying. If you remain to stay and abide in me and my words, the rhema word, the spoken word of God the, by the living voice of God, remain and abide in you, you shall ask, request, petition, or demand whatever you wish, and it will come into being. You hear that? You have words that you can speak if you allow God's word to reside in you, to abide in you. You have words that you can speak that are the requests, and God says, I will make them come to pass. Your words that you pray, I will make them come to pass. You will pray in faith, and I will make those words produce. Just like God spoke, and he said, let there be light. He says, I'm going to let you say, let there be this or that, and I'm going to make it come to pass if my word abides in you, and if you abide in me, right? That's if you remain in me. He said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you. You see, there's two things you got to do here. You got to remain in him and you got to have his word remaining in you. Now, his word can't remain in you if you don't know it in the first place. You got to put his word in you. You got to meditate on it day and night. Joshua 1.8. Talking about meditating on his word day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. If his word abides in you, his word abides in you. Now, you know what? If you have a glass full of muddy water and you pour enough water into it, fresh water, eventually it'll overflow and the mud will clear up and it'll come out and just be pure water because the muddy water will be displaced by the pure water. So I'm going to tell you, if you pour enough of God's word into you consistently enough and keep the mud out, it'll purify your heart. It'll cleanse you. It'll fill you with God's word, and you will be so full of God's word that if you don't add the muddy stuff, you're going to be walking and remaining in his word. You're going to be abiding in his word. You're going to be living in his word. You're going to be living out his word, and you'll see your life has power. Has power. Here's what the Lord says. If my words have been heard by you, if they've been taken into your heart, and by faith you have believed them to be true, 
then you can speak your words, a request, and I will hear your words and answer with the manifestation of the thing you've asked for. That's what God is saying to us. He said, if you let my word be powerful in you, you can ask what you desire, and I will fulfill that. Now, Jesus said, my words are spirit and life, and we can all accept that, can't we? Well, of course, you know, he's the son of God. It's not a stretch for us to believe that Jesus' words were powerful, that they carried the authority of God. It's not hard to think that, is it? It's always easy to see, though, how much different we are than Jesus. It's always easy to see how alien our ways are to his ways sometimes, how he seems so much more holy than us and so different, just we could never approach his glory. That's what we see. It's so easy for us to see our lack and understand that we can't be like Jesus, and so we accept that as a fact. But that isn't what God says about us. God doesn't say that about us. He actually wants us to understand that Christ is in us for the purpose of making us like Christ. He's in us to make us like him, not so we can always say, he's so far above us, he's so different than us, he's so strange to us. Oh, we could never approach that. God says, I want you to approach that. I want to change you. I want to make you just like Jesus, okay? God wants us to look just like Jesus. He's not satisfied leaving you looking like you used to look. He wants you to look more and more like Jesus. He wants you to go from glory to glory to glory. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, in the Good News translation. My wife was kind of cut her teeth on that translation, right? And that's one, Good News? Yeah. Of course, we would not dare classify ourselves or compare ourselves with those who rate themselves so highly. How stupid they are. <laughs> they make up their own standards to measure themselves by, and they judge themselves by their own standards. You know, a lot of us, we decide how good of a Christian we are by comparing ourselves to Christians who are not as good. <laughs> we compare ourselves among ourselves saying, well, I've come a long ways because I'm a lot better than sister so-and-so. You know what? You need to stop that. Those that compare themselves among themselves, the Bible says, are unwise, they're foolish. But what you need to do is compare yourself to Jesus. He's your standard, not me, not sister so-and-so. The object isn't to become better than others, it's to become like Jesus, okay? When you compare yourself to Jesus, how are you looking? Stand in the mirror next to Jesus and say, how do, we, do we look the same? Not yet. You're working on it? Amen. Now, when you compare yourself to Jesus, you decide how you look. Are you satisfied if you don't look anything like him? When you look in the mirror and say, you know, I look nothing like Jesus, but I'm okay with that. Are you okay with that? Don't be okay with that because Jesus wants you to look just like him. God actually intends for us to follow Jesus in everything he did so that we will end up becoming a true disciple and what is the definition of a disciple? What is it? We, are we, is anybody here a disciple of Jesus Christ? Okay. Now, I didn't say, are you a believer in Jesus? Because even the devils believe in Jesus. I said, are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? So what's a true disciple mean? Well, I'm going to tell you what. Let's let the word define what disciple means in Luke 640. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. When you're fully trained, you will be like the one who you're following. You'll be like him. Not you'll be sort of like, you'll be like him. Jesus wants to make us like him. He wants us to look like him. He wants the world to see him when they look at us. We go, oh, well, I got a long way to go. Well, okay, you got a long way to go. You know, start. Start now. Start to say, Lord, I want to become more like you. I want to change. I'm not satisfied with the way I am that's not like you, but I want to be just like you because it's your intention that I be your disciple so that when people look at me, they can take note, he's been with Jesus, right? Right? Do you know that sometimes when you see someone who sings a certain style of song, a certain they sing a certain way, that you can know exactly who they were inspired by because you say, oh, I, you know, they're kind of like so, I could tell they've been inspired by so-and-so. No, I'm not, I hope I don't embarrass him, but when we first, my wife and I first met uh, Trevor, he had a little bit of Elvis going on in his voice. He could sing like Elvis. 
And even sometimes he'd do a Christmas song with a guitar, and he'd play like Elvis, you know, one for the money, but it wasn't quite like that. <laughs> Little Town Called Bethlehem, that song, yeah. And my wife and I, when he'd do that, we'd say to him, we'd say, we're calling you Trelvis. <laughs> But you could tell he had, li- and, I, and when you talked to him back then, he'd say, yeah, I liked Elvis. He liked it. Didn't you like Elvis? Yeah. So you could tell he was inspired by Elvis when he sang sometimes. He had a tremolo in his voice, a more, you know, a vibrato. And you could tell, oh, he's been around Elvis. <laughs> now, you know, we actually have a person here, Frida. Where are you, Frida? Frida? Oh, she's with the kids. Frida actually was in an Elvis movie. Did you know that? Little known fact. Okay. So anyway, when he sang, you could kind of say that he's, He's been inspired by Elvis. You know, people, when they see you and me, they need to understand, you know what? I think they've been around Jesus. <laughs> you know what? I'm picking up from them the vibes. They've been around Jesus. It's quite obvious. They look like Jesus. They sound like Jesus. They talk like Jesus. That's the way it's supposed to be. We should look like our teacher. We should sound like our teacher. We should speak like our teacher. When somebody sees us, they should see Jesus, not just us. Okay? Ephesians 5, 1 through 2. Imitate God not Elvis, God, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. If you're following the example, it means you're being like him. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, as a pleasing aroma to God. Now, how are you doing in your pursuit of becoming like Jesus? Now, you might go, I'm a girl. I can't be like Jesus. He's a guy. No, 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 no. In your character, in your attitudes towards things. You see, sometimes we don't realize that God has taken certain things off the menu and we think they're still options. They're not options. They're not even on the menu, you know? Let it not once be named among you as becometh saints, right? Certain things. You know, um, for example, going off on somebody. Now, obviously, if your life is threatened, that's another story. That's an emergency fight or flight kind of situation. But going off on people, blasting people, you know what? We can do that, well, I was just mad. And God says, oh, well, you know what? Going off on people, that's, that's off the menu. You don't have that anymore. Well, but I, I just feel it. Yeah, I know, but it's not okay anymore. Yeah, but calling people names, yeah, I, they were this. Yeah, I know, but you can't do that anymore. But I'm, I'm weak. Well, you still can't do that anymore. It's not okay. Your words count. How you react counts. Your character counts. When people see you, they need to see the love of God in you. They need to see self-control. You see, that is the least, the least sought after, seems like, gift of the Holy Spirit is self-control. It's like, I don't want that. I want power. How about self-control? Because if you got self-control, that's the greatest power you can have to be able to control self. Because flesh wants to do all kinds of acting out. When you can control that, you are really a person who's got some power. So Jesus wants us to look like him. He wants us to do the things he did. He wants us to say the things he said. Now, when when God made it plain to us through his word that he wanted us to become like Jesus, um, did you get that assignment or were you out that day? Were you sick that day when the teacher said you're supposed to be like Jesus? Or did you think that assignment was for somebody else? Oh, that's for pastors. That's not for regular people. Well, it's time to do your makeup assignment because that's for you. Okay? It's time to embrace the assignment that the Lord has given to us all. And you have to turn it into a matter of importance in your life. You're only going to live so long. And we could all look at the, uh, the, the, the tables that the insurance companies have that says, well, you're probably going to live to be, you know, 79 or whatever. You know what? Nobody knows when you're going to die. You could die tomorrow. You don't know. So you don't, maybe don't have a lot of time to get this thing together, but you need to become more like Jesus. You need to yield yourself to Jesus. You need to say, I need to be like him because I want to be a true disciple. I don't want to be somebody who just speaks out idle words, but I want to be somebody that speaks his word in truth and in power. We need to be understanding that God intends for us to look like him in our words and in our actions both, okay? He wants us to be doers of the word as well as hearers of the word, not just hearers only. And doing is a thing that involves action. So doing works could be a thing like, uh, you know, like what Jamie was doing, you know, uh, feeding the poor, clothing the poor. Those are spiritual things, things like laying hands on people, seeing them healed. Those are doing things like Christ would do. 
But it's not just what you're doing that matters. It matters what you're saying, too. Okay? Your words are just as important as your actions to God. Because in God's eyes, words are often even more powerful than your physical acts. Colossians 3.17. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whatever you do or say. Not just do, but do or say. Both doing and saying matter, don't they? So let's recall where we started this journey in John 6.63. The Spirit alone gives life. Human effort accomplishes nothing, and the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. That's where we started. So that's true for Jesus, isn't it? The words he speaks are spirit and life. That's true for Jesus. Is that true for you? Are your words spirit, Holy Spirit, and life? Do your words bring God's spirit into the situation and God's life into the situation to those that hear your words? Oh, that's just Jesus. We can't do that. Well, Jesus says, actually, you can do everything I did. John 14, 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to the Father. Well, you're talking about healing the sick. I'm talking about everything. I'm talking about everything you do and everything you say. You can do it because Jesus is in you. Okay? So he doesn't expect me to really talk like him. Yes, he does, actually. He expects you to speak life into people. He expects you to speak destruction into the works of the enemy. He expects you to powerfully speak words that have power behind them of the Holy Spirit that carry out his plan. He actually expects you to be watering certain people so they will grow, to be planting seeds so that they will have a harvest. He wants your words to be carefully deposited in the right place. Um, it's an Old Testament scripture. It's in the Proverbs. But it just says, fine words fitly spoken are like apples of gold in frames of silver. And what it's saying is this, is that the right word in the right situation at the right time is a beautiful thing. And God gives you those words so that you can place them because they're powerful. You could change a person's life with words. Now, I remember my father-in-law, when he was alive, he worked down at U.S. Steel. And uh, there was this burger stand. I remember the burger stand right near U.S. Steel. And there was this, uh, he'd go there. They'd go there for lunch a lot of times. And they'd go there and stand in front of that stand. And, okay, we like two hamburgers. We like French fries, all this stuff. And there was this one girl who, who was very, very shy, very introverted. She thought she was not pretty. She thought she was not special. And they decided they'd do a little experiment, kind of a psychological experiment. Let's just start complimenting her. Let's start saying nice things about her. They say, you know, you look beautiful today. You know, you have the best smile, or whatever they were saying. And you know what? They saw this girl completely transformed. Suddenly, the bangs were out of her face. Suddenly, she was dressing nice. Suddenly, she felt like a brand new person just because people sowed words into her. Your words matter. Your words can bring life or death. Life and death is in the power of your words, right? You can speak, and things will happen because your words carry the same kind of power of God because the God who spoke the universe into existence, lives in you. Mark eleven twenty two 22 through 23. Have faith in God, Jesus said to them. Truly, I tell you that if anyone says to this mountain, did you hear that? If anyone says to a mountain, and do you talk to mountains very often? Be lifted up and thrown into the sea and has no doubt in his heart, but believes that it will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, listen to this. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. It says, whosoever shall say to this mountain, you mean you're going to talk to the mountain? You mean you're going to speak words? Yes, because our words are backed up by the Holy Spirit. Because our words are not idle words. Because our words are powerful. Because God's given his spirit to us so that we can speak with authority. And Jesus has given us authority over all the things of this earth. He's given us authority. And as we speak our words, the world can change. People's lives can change. Situations can change, you know? I mean, how many times have you tried this and seen, you know, you had some, like, I know people in the Midwest, you know, tornadoes coming towards their house, and they start speaking to that thing, and it just <laughs> diverts right around it. I remember one time back in the 70s, late 70s, uh, I told this story many times, but I'll make it short. Uh, my friend Ed and I, that was before I was married, um, we went to Hawaii. It was beautiful. It was fantastic. It was April. We'd always go in April back then. 
And uh, we loved Hawaii. I loved to swim in sunshine and all that. We come back to Seattle, and it was not, it was not beautiful. <laughs> it was raining and cold. It was 40-some-odd degrees and freezing. And I had one day before I had to go back to work, so I just decided, I'm just going to relax today. You know, flew back, catch up. And I, I went down to uh, Golden Gardens, and I walked along the beach, and it was stormy looking. It was gray. And I said, you know what? I just had a great time in Hawaii, and the sunshine and the blue sky, it just lifted my spirits. These people, their spirits aren't lifted. This thing's dragging on them. It's been cold and dark for a long time. Lord, they need some sunshine here. That's what they need. Crazy thing to say. But I just said, okay, so I'm going to pray right now. And I spoke out over the ocean, over the clouds, the gray clouds that were there. And I said, in the name of Jesus, and I'm about ready. I'm going to say something in faith. I'm going to say it in faith. In the name of Jesus, I command that all tomorrow, all these clouds go and that the temperature be in. And I thought I was like really going to step way out on the limb. I said, in the 70s. It was in the 40s. I mean, that's big, 30 degrees. In the 70s. And before the words came out my mouth, the Lord spoke strongly to me. He said, say 80s. I'm Oh, my God, that, that's a little beyond my faith, but I did. Let it be in the 80s. I couldn't believe I said it. And the next day, it was 82 degrees, and the weathermen said, we have no idea what just happened. And the day after that, it was back in the 40s. One day, it was in the 80s. It set all the records they had ever had for that day of the year. Your words are powerful. Your words are powerful. If we are to see ourselves as replicas of Christ, as, as imitators of Christ, as, as ambassadors of Christ, then we need to ask ourselves, are our words also spirit and life? They're supposed to be. Your words are spirit and life. Or they could be spirit and death if you speak in the wrong words. We are not just speaking vibrations in the air. Our words are powerful weapons against our enemy, and they are creative tools for God to use. May I suggest this? Just for a while until you get the hang of it, change your life a little bit. But ask yourself each day this question. Are the words that are coming out of my mouth today bringing God's spirit and life into this situation or something else? Start asking yourself that regularly. Are the words I'm speaking into this person's life, into my situation, into my home, are they bringing God's spirit and life or are they bringing something else? Start asking yourself those questions because it can change the way you speak. Because when you start to realize that every time you speak, little flames of fire come out, you watch what you say, don't you? Okay? If Jesus is my example, and if I'm his disciple, then he wants my words to be like his words, doesn't he? Am I doing that? Proverbs 15, 23. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Have you ever had somebody who you just know was used of the Lord a particular day, and they spoke something into you, it just changed everything for you? Just oh, thank God you came and spoke that refreshment over me. I'm so glad God gave you that for me because that changes everything. One word can be like cool water to somebody in a desert. One word, if God's in it, right? The patriarchs of the Old Testament, they believe words had power. You know, before they would die, they'd lay their hands on their sons, and, and they would pronounce a blessing over them, and they believed so much that whatever they said would come to pass, that it, it changed the destiny of those very kids they laid their hands on. They, they fulfilled the destiny of what that patriarch spoke over them because they believed their words had power. They didn't say, oh, it's nonsense. Oh, yeah, be blessed. Have a good life. No, they believed you are going to be one that is a king. You're going to be one that is over and not under. You're going to be one that, that has servants and is not a slave. And they spoke that over them. And you know what? It came to pass exactly as they said. Because they actually believe words had power. They believe words had power. The devil has lied to us. He said words don't matter. You can listen to those songs. You can swear. You say all that stuff. You can talk all that filth. That's not true. The truth is words matter more than you could ever imagine. So let's begin to live like words matter. Let's speak life over others. Let's speak destruction over the works of the adversary. In doing these two things, we are following our Lord Jesus Christ in word and in deed. Now, you guys were talking yesterday about an abortion clinic. You know what? Speak life over the people that are going to those and speak death 
over that building, over that place, and believe in your heart that God will carry out what you've spoken because your words carry the power of God because God lives in you. So, today, you could decide what to do. You know, sometimes we're cheap with our words. We're stingy with our words. Sometimes we don't tell somebody, you know, they're a blessing, they look nice and all that because, you know, oh, why bother? I, I just, I don't feel like it. You know what? Put yourself out there. Be generous. Sow some good seeds. Tell people how much they mean to you. Tell people how, how, how much you love them. Tell people how you see God in them. Speak life into them. And watch how it changes the whole world around you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming today.